Okay. So welcome to the 2022 webinars worth watching. So we're going to go over a quick introduction um, while we're recording and um, as we're getting started. And then we're going to have our great graduate students uh, give their presentations. So Greg, do you have anything to say? Greg and I started this, uh, I think three years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, <laughs> and uh, now here we are still in a pandemic, but do you have anything before we go over the logistics? No, I, I wasn't expecting to say anything. So it's um, fine. Just want um, to make sure. You know, I, I but but everyone knows that that I, I love talking. So um I, I just, you know, I'm so pleased that we're we're here. Um, you know, I think three years ago, uh we 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 never would have conceived that we would be where we are now. Um, but but um I'm I'm really happy that that webinars worth watching is still here and it's more relevant now than ever. So uh, thank you yes. all for participating and for attending. Yes, I agree. So my name is Sam Harlow. Um, I'm at UNCG University Libraries, and I'm the online learning librarians. And Greg and I came up with this a couple years ago as a way to include online graduate students within this. But again, as we've determined, um, this is again more relevant than ever, this idea of um, presenting online and being able to succinctly put our messaging in the online form. Um, so if you wanna learn a little bit more about why we got why we started this, it was again, just the idea of that, um, thinking about the success of something like three minute thesis, right? quickly presenting on very important research that's going on within um, graduate programs across UNCG. And again, a way to include both our online graduate students as well as our face-to-face -face graduate students. But it, when we started this three years ago, um, Zoom, WebEx, uh, Teams, were all just kind of getting more popular in terms of virtual interviewing, virtual meetings, you know, presenting dissertations. So we thought it was really important for graduate students to be able to present on their research within a time limit um, and think about their design and think about how they would hook people into the importance of their research uh, in a virtual format in this way. So here are the rules of the competition, just to be clear. So the graduate students created a uh, PowerPoint or Google slide or um, Canva, you know, some kind of slide deck presentation with no more than 10 slides, including their uh, credits and title slide. The webinars are limited to 10 minutes maximum and um, they will get cut off right at 10 minutes. Webinars are to be spoken words. Um, so no uh, song form or anything like that. Webinars are considered to have started when a presenter starts the presentation through speech. So the minute they start talking is when I will start timing them. And then we have a um, the judges, which I'll introduce in a second. They're using um, this rubric to get started. It's on the website, which is linked here. And it's also at um, go.uncg.edu slash www. That's our website. And then here is the rubric in case people want to follow along. This is what our judges will be using to score the um, uh, winners. The winners do win um, a cash prize. So we have a first choice, a second, a first place, second place, and people's choice. Uh, first place wins uh, $300, second place wins $200, and people's choice wins $100. It is possible for someone to get first, second, and also people's choice. Um, so that's a little bonus. So make sure you stay until the end to be able to vote in our people's choice awards. So our finalist judges this year are Greg, who you heard from, the Dean of the UNCG Graduate School, and Amy harris halk the Assistant Dean of Teaching and Learning at University Libraries. So thank you to our judges. They're here. Um, welcome. Um, and they will be using that rubric for scoring. So keep that in mind. Okay, so without further ado, we are going to have our first student go. So Kayla, whenever you're ready, you can share. I'm pulling up my timer. And remember the rules. Everyone, please stay muted. I will be monitoring this, Kayla, don't worry. And I am going to mute myself and stop my video. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kayla Baker and I am a PhD student in the Department of Educational Leadership and Cultural Foundations. And today I'll be sharing with you all a bit about a community project I conducted that explored Black women's perspectives on the socialization patterns of Black youth. 
My project stemmed from these three issues that are outlined here. So the first problem at hand is how race disproportionately impacts outcomes in many different social systems for Black people, but especially the education system. Secondly, there is a lack of representation of Black women's voices in the literature that discusses the status of Black youth. And this is probably because Black women are overwhelmingly underrepresented in the academy. And finally, there are these deficit models as opposed to asset-based approaches that are informing the literature that is used to frame the experiences of Black students. Here are some statistics concerning the reality that the Black youth are facing today and what really inspired the project that I created. So during my coursework, we were reading about the problems that Black youth were facing in the education system and how there were all of these social structures in place that have resulted in the reproduction of social inequality for Black people. And as you can see with these statistics, it really only highlights the negative aspects of Black student outcomes and is extremely deficit focused. Constantly reading about how Black students are much more likely to be in high poverty schools, how they're overrepresented among those disciplined in schools, how they have the lowest average GPA when compared to other racial groups, and how the educational expectations that they have for themselves achieving higher levels of education in the eighth grade decline by the time they get to the 10th grade was really discouraging for me. And as we explore the, the circumstances that Black youth were facing, there really wasn't enough conversation about the strategies, both on the individual and systematic levels that are needed to combat and dismantle the behaviors, discrimination, and systems of oppression that result in such circumstances outlined here and that impede the success of Black youth. So I wanted to create this project to investigate and capture the perspectives and voices of six Black women on the influences that are impacting Black youth, how Black youth are socialized, and the philosophy from which Black women teach them. You might ask, why is it important to uplift Black women's voices and on the conditions of Black youth? Well, Black women are considered the backbone of the Black community and heads of many households. In 2018, a study found that Black women were the head of 27% of all Black households, which was more than twice the rate of all women at 12%. In 2020, there were about 4 million Black families in the United States with a single mother. And compared to white women, Black women are spending an average of 12 more hours per week caring for children. Black women in the workplace are the least likely to feel valued and treated with respect. So often Black women are going ignored, disregarded, and silenced. And so I really wanted to create a platform for Black women's voices because their voices are valid and are great sources of knowledge. Creating a virtual, excuse me, a visual representation of the passion and love that Black women have for the Black community and for Black youth was extremely important for me and their perspectives are definitely needed if we're truly gonna understand the influences on Black youth and how we can support, uplift and empower this group. My project was guided by three questions. How do Black women interpret the meaning of being Black in America? How does this meaning impact what Black women teach Black youth, and how do Black women use strategies of resilience and perseverance to combat the societal influences on Black youth? I used movement and choreography to artistically express the responses that the women provided during their interviews. And dance is a way that I personally like to increase social awareness on various topics and contribute to social activism. I organized their teaching and social, socialization philosophies into two themes using quotes from the interviews. And as I go through the quotes, I'll present still shots from the choreography. You'll notice that you'll only see the silhouettes of the women's bodies in motion. And this is intended to represent how black, the black race is silenced, made to feel invisible and cast in the shadows. The great thing about art is that it's open to interpretation and can have many different representations. So as I go through these photos, I want you all to kind of take note of how would you interpret 
the movements being shown. The women shared how Black people and Black history was associated with struggle and limitations. And I want to reflect that through this quote, we must look to history and our ancestors. They, these photos here are intended to represent how the women express how they were inspired by those struggles from history. And they wanted to make sure that they taught their youth about where they come from. There was this appreciation of black history as it allowed them to recognize how far black people have come and it gave them hope for progress that they could make in the future. Their teaching philosophies were really grounded in this recognition of the sacrifices of their ancestors and pulling on the strength and tenacity that is deeply instilled in them from these historical ancestral figures. Because of the historical past, they knew that they could overcome these challenges that they may face, and they really wanted to make sure that message was passed down to younger generations. The importance of the of, of history and the inspiration from history and ancestors was depicted in choreography through these outstretched hands that you see in the arms, elongated leg extensions, as well as the leaps and jumps that indicate they're moving forward. The next quote is we raise them with a certain amount of caution and awareness. These women were very clear about the importance of raising black youth to understand that the playing field is not even. They indicated that they have to raise their youth with a certain amount of caution and mindfulness that they felt white parents necessarily didn't have to teach their youth. So examples mentioned were um, having the talk sharing that they're born with one strike against them just because of the color of their skin and letting them know that yes, you can reach your goals, but you'll have to work twice as hard to accomplish them. The women felt it was really important for their youth to know what they're fighting against. So when we talked about the negative societal influences, they named things like stereotypes that folks hold, the role of media and how that impacts how Black youth perceive themselves, the education system, teacher expectations, standardized testing, and the lack of representation in the curriculum, um, as well as police brutality, the judicial and prison system. They also wanted their Black youth to know that they needed to be connected to people intentionally and ways to find support and community. So they told their youth that they should be connected to people who will set a positive example for them and who will be invested in their lives and willing to make the necessary moves to ensure their success, growth, and development. So examples such as strong ties to their family, church, and even white allies were mentioned as important strategies. And so I'm hoping that the importance of this connection, yet this constant battle of telling youth they can be who they wanna be, but being careful and cautious as how they go about it is represented through movements such as holding their fist um, and falling back into the arms of others. This project resulted in me developing a flow chart for people who want to develop their own teaching philosophy for engaging in and and with and supporting a specific population, particularly one from a marginalized identity. So you wanna start with asking, what does it mean to have this identity in the current social environment that we're living? What factors or influences are shaping and informing your thoughts on this meaning? What's the reality that people from that specific identity are currently facing? And what are the societal messages being sent to this group? What would you wanna teach this group in order to combat or affirm the messages that they're being sent. So I encourage you to think about what are some specific populations you would like to encourage or engage with more positively. And this could be used as a, a way to inform your philosophy. The way you support groups should be informed by the voices of those who hold their identities. For Black youth specifically, we can truly learn from how Black women cultivate and maintain community and the lengths they go to support Black youth. I would like to thank you all for listening today, as well as thank the six Black women and the dancers centered in my work. Yay! That was great! You're getting some applause in the chat. Um, I'm putting Kayla's information in the chat as well. I'm sorry I didn't do that. I didn't want to interrupt her flow, but Kayla, this is the title of Kayla. 
Um, Kayla is from Educational Leadership Cultural Foundations, her advisor, and yes, so good. So at this point, we do give the judges um, a couple, like, you know, a minute or so. Kayla, you were at nine minutes, 57 seconds. You, that was like, <laughs> nice <A -plus> timing. <laughs> Great job. Um, yeah, that was really good. So yay. So everyone, if you, um, we do have a, um, people are giving you praise in the chat too, Kayla, if you want to look there, um, because please stay tuned for all of it. Even if you're here, um, as Kayla's, uh, colleague, friend, family, um, we will release the people's choice at the end to be, uh, fair and to have everyone be able to see it. Uh, so stay tuned for the people's choice. There are two other presentations. And um, Amy and Greg, uh, just let me know when you're done scoring. Okay. I love one of the things I love about this presentation is that um, people outside of UNCG can come in as well. So if you're from outside of UNCG, welcome. We love having you come and see people's research, your loved ones research, your friends research. So thank you for being here. Um, so our next up as uh, our judges are finishing up are I'm putting it in the chat. Okay, so Greg, you're good. Okay, so I just put our next contestant in the chat. It's Claire Newman, kinesiology, and the title of her presentation is Centering Player Voice as a Means for Equity. So Claire, whenever you're ready, you can um, share your screen. Okay, and Claire. Is your camera on? You're muted, Claire. Sorry. Now it's be on. Awesome. All right. So let me go back to my screen share. Yeah. Take your time. Again, we um, did have one student who couldn't make it, so it's fine. We have a little padding. It's great. No rush. Okay, right. I see your camera. I see your screen. Um, again, y'all did great for Kayla. So just remember for Claire, same deal. Um, camera's off, remain muted. Uh, if Claire does ask you questions in the chat, uh, feel free to answer in the chat. Perfect, and I will do that, so all right. Um, Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire Newman. I am a doctoral student in the Department of Kinesiology, and my research really looks at centering clear voice as a means for equity. So before we begin, please write in the chat what you think the difference between equality and equity is. Equality is giving everyone the same. Equity is giving them what they need. Equality is treating everyone the same. Equity is dressing needs good. Awesome. Wow, yeah, I like what Sam said. Yes, Sam was spot on. Equity addresses needs. Really well done. So you all have the right idea. So this picture here from the Interaction Institute for Social Change really highlights the difference between equality and equity that at least I um, observe and see in my research. So as you can see, the three individuals in the first picture for equality, each were given one box to stand on, but this left some individuals without the ability to see over the fence where equity is recognizing that the individuals were different heights and so therefore needed different boxes. And now all three individuals can see over the fence. So sports have always been painted in society and the media as universally good things. An arena that levels the playing field where individuals can rise from rags to riches, flourish and develop. Yet sports arenas have become privatized arenas. 
The percentage of youth participating in sports continues to decrease and youth from minoritized backgrounds continue to be excluded for various reasons. So for example, you have a young refugee boy who wants to play soccer. He will face numerous barriers in order to participate. One of the first ones is money. One of the biggest predictors of sports participation is parents' income. Then you have things such as equipment needs, transportation, things that are less frequently thought about are things such as language barriers, um, familial expectations, like the need for a sibling to watch after younger siblings or take care of the house, or cultural norms or established practices within a household that may not recognize sport or physical activity as an important aspect of life. Once marginalized youth overcome these barriers and actually allowed on a team, they face even more barriers. One common recreation practice is to draft or randomly redistribute players across the community. So although this may be done with good intentions, minoritized players become these token players for diversity and coaches start to ignore their individual culture, their language, and individuals are left without the power to speak up because they are alone in their cultural experience. This presents the needs for coaches to recognize the cultural and diverse experience that youth bring with them to the team. Part of my research is utilizing um, TPSR, which is teaching personal and social responsibility that really empower youth. So before we begin, this is considered an asset-based model. And I think it's important to recognize that we all bring assets to the table. So please write in the chat, what is one of your best assets? Sam's organized and good at time management, oh, organization, problem solving, communication, patience, ideation, encouragement, organization. I love that. Wow. So look at how awesome all of you are. And just how awesome all of you are, youth also bring these powerful assets to the table. And so TPSR recognizes that youth are resources to be developed rather than problems to be solved. It is a model developed by Don Hellison that purposefully integrates life skills such as respect, effort, goal setting, leadership into sports and or physical activity. It is a loose progression of these four levels that culminate in this idea of transfer or the ability for players to utilize these life skills outside of the program in their homes, communities, and schools. Hellison was extremely intentional in his efforts to integrate personal and social responsibility. So he established something called a daily format. In this daily format, you start with relational time, which is five to 15 minutes at the beginning of practice when a coach interacts with players, recognizes them individually and mentions something special about them or unique to them. Um, this is followed up by an awareness talk, which is an opening talk at the start of practice to really emphasize the value or level that you want to focus on that day. The physical activity plan is the largest chunk of time and TPSR principles, so one of those four levels, is embedded into each physical activity you do. The group meeting is at the end of practice where players can discuss how the program went that day. They're given opportunities to give feedback, constructive criticism, and even shout out their teammates. Self-reflection is essentially the end of practice where players take a moment to assess their own responsibility for that day. So integral to all of these aspects is the idea of choices and voices, where a coach works in collaboration with youth. Players are given opportunities to engage in group discussions. They get to vote as a group. They get to make individual choices. We, they are invited to give suggestions, their opinion, or even evaluate the team or the program. So coaches are no longer this authoritarian figure, but rather they work with players to create the team atmosphere that they want to see. So, so from this TPSR model, I sought to investigate why is voice so important? This led me to develop my research question, investigating how being able to utilize their voice impacted player experience. My case study was a part of a much larger state case study that looked at self-determination theory and player experience within that TPSR format. So I coached a refugee boy soccer team for a year and a half. We provided transportation, we covered costs, we paid for equipment and made sure that we overcame all of those barriers we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Um, so we end up having 18 refugee boys, majority are from Africa as seen in that illustration, where a few are from Mexico. On the team, there are eight languages spoken, a range of years lived in the United States, and they are displaced around Guilford County. 
So this created an atmosphere where despite all of these boys are labeled as refugees, they all have very unique experiences. So why was voice so important? Um, voice was a means for equity. So all of these quotes are from individual interviews that um, one of my co-researchers had with the inter individuals and the boys were given pseudonyms. So if we remember that illustration by the Interaction Institute for Social Change, you can really see that equity is recognizing that not all players needed the same thing from the coach to reach the same goals. As you can read, Ron emphasized, in this team, you just bring your culture out there because there's some soccer communities, it's only white people or they only let me say English. Mamadi say, said, the way you talk to me is the same way, you, is not the same way you talk to other players, but we all feel cared for. Here you can see that by centering player voice, players felt like they could bring their culture with them, that their opinion mattered, and that even they, they, everyone felt cared for despite having different relationships with the coach. Voice was also a means for empowerment. So one of the main goals of TPSR is for kids to not only learn about personal and social responsibility, but physically be able to take personal and social responsibility and apply it to their own lives. So Ron explained, I like it how coach, she goes, she takes our ideas and goes home and uses those ideas to find a way to put into practice. So like you see the ideas you talked. Dio said, effort means even if somebody tells you you're not good at it, just keep trying until you prove them wrong. And it means keep working hard, no matter what happens, have a strong heart. So centering player voice allowed for players to be empowered to do anything they wanted as long as they put effort in it. It allowed them for them to feel like their ideas mattered because they could see them utilized in practice. And it felt like they could work hard, they could do anything they wanted. Voice was also a means to create meaningful relationships. One large aspect of the team is that it's largely relational. Dio said, if you want to join the team, I'll show you what to do, how to do it. I'll be here daily. Whenever you need me, you can come to me. So just support them and make them feel alive. He later said, yeah, I made new friends. And there are things that they're showing me, like their effort, their teamwork, their everything. And it makes me want to make more friends and bring them to the team. Team atmosphere is emphasized on the fact that we have a social responsibility to be respectful and help and lead others. You can see this illustrated in the quotes from these young men, the desire to bring more people to the team and experience this unique environment. So why does this matter? Although there's a continued need to improve in terms of equity, especially for these minoritized youth who tend to have their cultural experience ignored or already excluded, this case study showed hope. In this case example, you can see that centering player voice help our players to feel recognized, cared for, and develop meaningful and understanding relationships. And utilizing TPSR, relationships are a valuable foreground to produce and empower positive assets in youth. These aspects are intentionally integrated throughout practice as seen in Halison's daily format. It is not left up to chance, but is very explicit. I would like to acknowledge Sari, who helped me work with this team, the Fusion Foundation for giving me the opportunity, my advisor, Dr. Michael Hemphill, Dr. Thomas Martinick, son, Malik, and Josh, who are my lab, as well as my friends and family who support not only me, but these refugee boys. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see how I can. Great job. Oh, and I'm seeing your very cute dog. Great job. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, you are at nine minutes, 57 seconds, 56 seconds. So you and Kayla, great timing. Yay. You're getting a lot of applause, um, a lot of praise in the chat. Um, so, yeah. Great job. Okay. So the next one we're doing is a recording. Um, one contestant could not be here. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, share my sound. Um, so I am gonna test like a little, like a second of it and make sure y'all can hear it before um, I play the video, just to give everyone a heads up on that. 
um, as Amy and Greg are finishing up their scoring, I'm going to put the next contestant's information in the chat. Um, she is not here live, but this, but it is um, Meg Osland from Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Horror and the Horrorific, How Modern Horror is Interacting with Horror Nostalgia Through Shifting Lenses. So Amy and Greg, just let me know when you're done. I'm not going to have to time this one because this contestant was timed with the same rules as these um, contestants had today, to be fair. Okay, Greg, you're good. Amy's not changing. Okay, so bear with me just so we make sure that the sound is working on this. So y'all should see this. So before um, I start, let me share my sound or share sound. Okay, so someone in the chat, let me open the chat up. Let me know that you can hear this. No? It's not playing. So, I'm going to open up the MP4. You want me in the. Okay, did y'all hear that? Now I'm like in full screen mode of this. Yes, okay, great. So, let me open that back up. You want me in the recording? Uh, and um, I'm going to mute and I will just push the timer again when you start talking. So take your. <laughs> oh, it's fine. I, I have found that with this. Sorry, I had this all set up. And let me mute myself. Um, hi, my name is Meg Osland. I am a master's student in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program, and I'm going to be talking about horror in the horrific and the shifting lenses of horror through nostalgia. So over the past 10 years, how horror has been going through a sort of shift. Um, we sort of see uh, prestige horror caught in the mainstream attention. Uh, through creators like Jordan Peele and Ari Aster. The Studio A24 has become renowned for its introspective thrillers and their plethora, there are a plethora of horror uh, remakes and reboots coming out. What this renewed vigor in the horror movie industry says is that there's a market for nostalgic fear. This idea of nostalgic fear takes root in a neoliberal framework, which basically positions the movies in a neoliberal society within the norms and themes of that society. Um, nostalgia and neoliberalism are a sort of connected narrative within this. Um, so what I aim to explain is how these norms of neoliberal nostalgia in contemporary horror demonstrate a shift in how these stories are created and the critical lenses that interact with them. To start, let's take a look at these terms, neoliberalism and nostalgia, and how they engage with each other. Uh, neoliberalism is a view of society's economic and political situation that generally endorses a liberal capitalist society. The economic factors of neoliberalism influence policy decisions is kind of a good breakdown of that. Um, so how does this interact with nostalgia? Uh, nostalgia can be interpreted as a harbored affection for the past, better times, as it's often put. So through nostalgia, we're able to relate to the elements of our past that mean something to us. And the way that this interacts with media is through common tropes, genres, references to specific time periods. Um, we engage with these concepts of nostalgia through rose-colored glasses, seeing a glamour of the past that negates more unsavory parts. This is the neoliberal component. So if we focus on the marketable parts of a time period, a memorable commercial or a classic song, we are able to market the past in a contemporary framework. So neoliberal nostalgia interacts with the horror genre 
often because classic horror movies draw a wide nostalgic audience. I could tell you, you know, think of 80s slashers and you could tell me at least some aspect of that subgenre. Um, while nostalgia can offer um, a nuanced look into the culture and society of the past, when marketed to an audience of the present, there's a tendency for neoliberalism to gloss over more political aspects, or at the very least, only slightly verge on the progressive side. Um, nostalgia in contemporary horror is rendered subjective, emotional, emotional terms so as to be experienced as the loss of a past so inaccessible that it never was, um, from Zoe Ann Lacks. It harkens a shift in lenses from the classics, but without critical analysis that's really needed to interrogate those kind of tropes and a nostalgic fear that's just comfortable enough to never really scare you. Uh, let's get a better idea of how this nostalgia interacts with horror tropes through examining some of the common ones. So far and wide, the most utilized of horror tropes is that of the final girl. We can find her origin in the mid 1970s slasher through uh, such films as Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and most famously, John Carpenter's Halloween. Carol J. Clover outlines um, archetypes like this and specifically uh, outlines the final girl as abject horror personified, where the character is meant to outlast her friends, either being saved or killing the monster in the end. This character is almost entirely female. Another element of the final girl to consider is that she's being predominantly white, heterosexual, sex, heterosexual, sorry, uh, but virginal and cisgender. So anyone who falls outside of this criterion in mainstream horror has historically been killed off or been the monster this whole time. Where contemporary re remakes come into play, there have not been many changes to these factors. With the exception of the remake Black, Black Christmas and Candyman, the nostalgic horror film of contemporary acclaim don't really confront the issues of race, homophobia, transphobia of horror's past. Instead, they choose to alter the character of the final girl to promote a more strong female lead while still maintaining the same bar of representation, representational marketing. And even within this marketability, it seems to be set within a girl boss filter. Uh, Clover even remarks that it's detached from her low budget origins and messier meanings. She now circulates in these mostly cleaner and more upscale venues as a female Avenger or triumphant feminist hero and the like. I would argue that this shift in perspective doesn't offer a more nu nuanced take on the genre conventions. Um, but rather kind of reconstructs the horror protagonist within the same nostalgic gaze, just through a different archetype and gender. We shift out of the final girl of classic horror's past and instead bring forth a sort of Sarah Connor-esque figure whose boyish demeanor downplay a more explicit feminist tone that could have been. Another kind of like key element to nostalgic or horror that sort of narrows the scope um, within which neoliberal nostalgia operates is the idea of the classics in um, nostalgia and nostalgic horror. So when I previously mentioned horror classes, classics, I was specifically referring to a horror canon that privileges the slasher, paranormal, and sci-fi thriller. Neoliberal nostalgia tends to omit subgenres like torture porn. Uh, torture porn specifically has been outcast within the horror realm, as well as outside of that specifically, um, simply from its name as a presumptuous response to a subgenre's film, as by Steve Jones. Uh, movies like Hostel and Saw, which have seen some of their own reboots, haven't really quite hit the same critical appeal, appeal as classic horror remakes. Um, this is interesting because of the nuances that torture porn kind of offers in the offset of the slasher. Um, so torture porn adapts established slasher conventions to augment horror, since it's unclear whether any characters will still be alive when the end credits roll. It's a kind of change to the dynamic between characters and salvation that doesn't fall into the lens of neoliberal nostalgia. The fantastical uh, glamorizing past of the time periods or of the time period that it involves and the themes that kind of are invoked in that um, nostalgia, um, there's less room for an ultraviolet storytelling through torture porn. 
it's it's still stuck on that contemporary work, or I'm sorry, the um, the slasher work. Um, so it's seen through past and present as gratuitous, uh, explicit without cause, negating the true fear that the subgenre musters. Um, you can even see it in the same franchise. Rob Zombie's Halloween uh, installments in the series have been regarded as horror flops. Meanwhile, the recent reboot that was a clear homage to Carpenter's original and even includes Jamie Lee Curtis's reprising of Lori at, in all her new girl boss glory <laughs> um, has seen far more critical acclaim. So I mentioned... Um, Halloween specifically a couple times already, just because it is a very clear example of a lot of the neoliberal nostalgia that gets interplayed with classic horror remakes. And another one of the most glaring examples of that is in regards to uh, mental illness. Um, the conversation and representation of mental illness within this franchise is in need of some severe critical analysis. He, Michael Myers is seen as the boogeyman and originally a dehumanized monster in the film, and it's clearly very harmful to people who suffer from mental illness. And this depiction is actually carried out into the Halloween 2019 film as well. We still see Michael as mentally ill, and he's located in a mental institution in one of the inciting incidents, um, and it showcases an assortment of caricatures of mentally ill people around him. They instill a fear or unease that's theme, seen through a monstrous aesthetic of Halloween's nostalgic lens. So my goal of this research is to show that we think that we should think critically about the content that we consume because it can cause real harm. The marketability of life that we see in horror privileges white cis heterosexual neoliberal lenses and are deeply rooted in nostalgia. So the only changes that we see kind of come through a feminist capitalist motivation, as Lindsay Ellis would say, it's that thing you like, but woke. Um, and the intentionality of nostalgia is just to market from the original. Um, so I think the intent, the intent of horror to expose our fears and expose societal norms that create those fears needs to continue on. It's important to kind of expose that framework in contemporary work because the things that scared us in the past can still scare us now and okay. they still happen. We're at 10 minutes. Okay. Y'all heard that fine. I did text someone in the room and confirmed it was working because it like took over my whole screen. Yes, applause for Meg, Meg couldn't make it live. Um, so that was Meg's presentation. So Amy and Greg, finish up scoring um, in this moment and I will um, get the people's choice. Please don't leave yet, we're about to release the people's choice. Um, so while Greg and Amy are finishing up their scoring, they are emailing me on the back end and I'm gonna get y'all that people choice link. Um, you can only vote once, it's set up that way, um, but uh, feel free to vote for whoever you want, obviously. And there it is. Please let me know if the link doesn't work for you, but it, I tested it a couple of different ways without filling it out. Um, so there it is. So this is that time where we have to do the judges scoring and um, y'all are filling out the people's choice. So there will be like a break in the recording. Um, I'm going to pause the recording so that we don't have this really long um, pause here while y'all fill this out. Okay, we're recording again after a break. I forgot to say this, but our people's choice winner was Claire. So again, for the recording, thank you. So congratulations, Claire, you're our People's Choice winner. Our People's Choice winner gets $100. So now we are gonna announce the uh, first place winner. I'll do it that way. And it is Kayla. So great job, Kayla, you're first. So that is a $300 prize. And it turned out that uh, our second place winner is 
Claire. So Claire, you get a um, second place prize as well. So it evens out that you both get $300. Congratulations. <laughs> so uh, great job, everyone. And thank you so much to Meg. If she ends up watching the recording, it was really great. It was a competitive year. It's always a competitive year uh, for all of this. I just want to say again, UNCG has great students and great grad students. And uh, I love working at UNCG, but I particularly love the students. Um, so y'all have really lured me in for that stuff. So congratulations to our um, finalists and our winners. And uh, it's a Friday and I'm excited. So this was um, really great. Thank you all for coming. This makes it better that y'all came. I always get worried every year. I'm like, no one's gonna come, but it's so great. So y'all got to see how great that this competition is. Tell your friends, we do it every year around this time. Uh, dates to be determined. So thanks everyone again. Um, Kayla and Claire, we will be in touch in the next uh, early week or so to talk about how to get your um, prize. And have a great weekend, everyone. Um, thank you again. Congrats. And thanks to Greg and Amy, particularly, of course, for judging. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Bye.